coming up on This Week in Radio Tech. We've got a great guest. It's Marcus O'Rourke. We've heard from him before, but now there's something different. Yes, he's got an award under his belt that's pretty cool, and his uh, peers voted for it. Plus, he's going to be showing us some amazing videos, the kind of videos he produces to share broadcast engineering information with everyone. It's coming up next on Twerk. This Week in Radio Tech is brought to you by Broadcasters General Store, with outstanding service, savings, and support online at bgs.cc. By Broadcast Bionics, with the Bionic Studio, including talk show control, social media, and visual radio, Broadcast Bionics brings exceptional audience engagement to radio and TV. By Angry Audio, audio problems disappear when you get angry at angryaudio.com. By Nautel, worry-free transmission you can count on with outstanding control, reliability, efficiencies, and Nautel's unmatched 24-7 customer support online at Nautel.com. And by Max Connect Wireless, prioritized high-speed internet service designed for transmitter sites and remote broadcasts. Hey, welcome into This Week in Radio Tech, the show where we talk about everything from uh, the microphone to the light bulb at the top of the tower and extracurricular activities. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, education, how to document that education, how to tell other people what you're doing. And uh, I'm, I'm really excited for this show because, you know, I never seem to have spare time. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, like most of us. But uh, th- there are some videos out there that are worth watching, and we're going to force some of them upon you during the show today. So I'm Kirk Harnack. I'm here in the Telos Alliance studio in Nashville, Tennessee, which is another name for my beautiful, uh, partly finished out basement here. It's actually a very nice room. Uh, I've got a window to the outside, even though this part of the basement is not underground. So I'm looking out at a at a big old severe thunderstorm right now. So let's hope that all the power stays on and and things stay working. That's it for me. Uh, Chris Tarr, you got a thunderstorm there? Is it nice weather there in Mukwanago? It is beautiful out. You can see mine, the same thing, finished basement. There's the window out to the uh, the, the side yard there. Uh, fortunately, we've had great weather all week. I had to put on, I uh, installed an antenna and got two translators on the air yesterday, day before, doing a C-band dish with the uh, filters and everything. So I've been a busy guy, but the weather here has just been fantastic. So. Uh, it was very conducive to getting some outdoor field work done, which certainly beats sitting in an office. So, Chris, today we are sitting here on the show. We're about to introduce uh, a, a nationwide award winner, and that means that his peers recognized him for some some value, some award, and uh, it, it actually won't be conferred to him until the SBE's uh, a big national meeting in Syracuse, New York. But let's bring in. Marcus O'Rourke. Marcus, welcome to This Week in Radio Tech. So does that mean it's not real until it's converted? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it means you can't hang it on the wall or put it all over the fireplace or on the coffee table and, until uh, whenever the, until September, until you actually get I mean, I black. Could, I could draw you something on a piece of paper that you could stick on your wall. <laughs> yeah, exactly. On a napkin. Temporary one. And, yeah, 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 there you go. <laughs> and we're not giving away a secret. This is, this is news on the SBE website, and uh, I think there's already been an article about it, hasn't there? Has there been uh, some, yeah, Radio some... World did something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, good deal, good deal. Well, Marcus, um, hey, if you would tell us just a, for a minute about this this award. What does this mean? What is it for? Uh, so the Educator of the Year Award is, uh, it recognizes someone who has basically been out in front uh, educating our peers, our other engineers, and educating those coming into the industry and even those who are not in the industry, you know, like um, maybe program directors, DJs, or even sometimes the public who are interested in radio, and kind of giving them that glimpse of, of what radio is about and teaching them something in, in the meantime. For me, I it wonder, means I'm trying to be educational and entertaining, but... Uh, how, how, uh, how do you think... Uh, do you know anything about the process of how you were... Uh, selected, voted upon, and, and awarded this honor? I heard there was a nomination, and other than a phone call I got on Friday saying, hey, by the way, <laughs> I don't know the process. Who, who called you? Um, uh, Megan from the SBE National Office. Megan Clapp. Okay, awesome. Yep. Awesome. Wow. Chris, you ever got a phone call like that? Well, Mr. Tar, you've been recognized by your peers. 
Well, usually it's I've been recognized by the local police or something, <laughs> but never, never peers really. You know, can't say that I have. Uh, the local con- constabulary, yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, uh, viewers and friends, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, congratulations to Marcus O'Rourke for uh, being awarded the SBE's Educator of the Year uh, for 2022. And um, well, in, in this episode, you're going to see why he got nominated and voted upon positively for that. Uh, we got we have some of his work, some of Marcus's work coming up. It's beautiful, interesting, informative, entertaining, all that. It's all coming up. Hey, I want to tell you real quick about Nautel, the website Nautel.com, and they don't have any um, – Uh, Transmission Talk Tuesday is coming up in August. That's taking a little break, but they do have over 200 free technical tools to have in your toolbox. Uh, One of those things is Transmission Talk Tuesday is taking a break, but there are uh, 25 videos that answer your most common technical question about, uh, for example, repairs of of Nautel products. Oh, good. Nice job there, Suncast. Zooming up on that. Uh, Tips and tricks from security to critters. Technical tips from award-winning educator Jeff Welton. Uh, Plus over 30 comprehensive e-books providing a wide range of radio broadcasting topics there. And uh, 40, over 40, in-depth webinars covering a wide range of topics that qualify for SBE recertification credits. Uh, There's also a bunch of white papers, in-depth tech papers from Nautel engineers that go really in-depth. And there's also a very popular thing, the radio coverage tool. uh, If you have station coverage questions, you can create maps and uh, look at different test scenarios. Uh, Worry-free from transmission from Nautel. So go to Nautel.com. You'll find some of this under webinars. You'll find a lot of this under their resources tab. So just go to Nautel.com and hit the resources button. And that'll get you to a lot of these uh, tips and tricks, webinars, it's all there, over 200 free technical tools for us in the industry. And it's all free from Nautel. A lot of very well-researched stuff and all of it uh, born out of experience. Thanks a lot to Nautel at Nautel.com for providing all these services to the industry. All right. uh, We need to jump right into this. Uh, Marcus, we've got our first um, our first uh, video that we're going to look at. And yeah, I, okay, I feel a bit like we're cheating here. We're not creating <laughs> a whole hour of content today on This Week in Radio Tech. Rather, we're going to be uh, showing some of your content that yeah, that you've produced. And that's that's a that's a good thing to do. Um, uh, Is Marcus, like those old school uh, clip shows? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um it kind of set this up for us. We're going to be looking. I mean, I know these videos kind of set themselves up, but at least give us a little context for the generator replacement video. I love this video, and I haven't watched it all the way through, but kind of set this up for us, generator replacement. Uh, so that that Saturday, right before NAB started, uh, okay, backing up a little bit more, we had a building generator here for backup power, and it was put in when the building was built in 1980 or something like that. Uh, ran for many, many years, finally just gave up the ghost, and finally we were able to get a new one delivered, and the crane people and everything happened at once. So this is pulling the generator out, putting the new generator up on, and uh, just kind of showing that more of the, the showy process of replacing a generator, because, I mean, how exciting is it to watch an electrician sit there and well, we've we've got some that's, awesome. That's not sh- that much fun, but yeah, we got some awesome shots. Here. This, this is video is five minutes long. It's just under five minutes long. Uh, Suncast, let's roll it. Let's see this thing. Today's the day. I know I've talked about this in the past, but today is the day. We've got a new generator. So the new generator is here. It's on the back of the truck for right now. Uh, the crane should be arriving shortly, and the old generator is being ready to be pulled out. So I know I've talked about this in the past. The generator replacement. Sure I have. If not, well guess what? We're getting a new generator on top of our building. That's why they have the hard hat. So we have a crane coming. Should be here very, very soon. So uh, let's go. This generator was installed when the building was built back in 1980s-ish. So it served us for almost 40 years. I say almost because the last couple of years it hasn't been working. A little bit of planning before we start moving large and heavy items about, and then it's off to work getting the mounting points free. 
Once the generator is free, it's pulled out just a bit to allow the crane to hook up. Speaking of the crane, guess who just pulled in while this was happening? Work continued on the roof while the crane pulled in and got set up. If you're ever in a situation like this, you need to find a good company that takes safety seriously. And most of them do. The crane guys do, and it made this whole event smooth and safe. As they prepared the crane, it was a good opportunity to grab a quick breakfast pastry and coffee. Then it was time to pull the exhaust piping off the roof and get ready for the generator itself to come down. Finally, after much hard work, the generator was hooked up and began to make its final journey off the roof. Once the old generator was on the ground, the new one was prepared to be hoisted. I got back up to the roof just in time to see the new generator arrive. Before it's put into place, the old mounts needed to be removed and the bolts taken out by the angle grinder. Then, slowly, the new generator was brought into the building. Our facilities manager from Aramark, John, was on hand to ensure the process went smoothly. John was the facilities manager for about 20 years before moving over to Aramark when they were contracted to handle maintenance on campus. Slowly, the generator was put on rollers and moved into place. After that, the crane was released and off they went on to another job. Well, that's it. The crane's away and off. The new generator is up on the roof. The old generator's down on the ground, ready to go be scrapped. And that's it. Now for the electrical uh, side of things, of so getting everything hooked back up into the automatic transfer switch and all that stuff will take place over the next week or so and then we'll have a new emergency generator for the building. That's good because that also feeds us for the radio station studios in case of a power outage. So, all right. Thanks for watching. Thanks for being a part of this channel. I appreciate it. And um, until we see you again, stay safe, stay healthy. See you next time. That is awesome. I, I, I got questions already. I got questions, Marcus. Shoot. So, um, uh, fuel, was it lift, hoisted with fuel or did you have to bring fuel up later? No, no. So we have, uh, we, we brought fuel up later. We have a day tank that's up there and just feed fuel into that, which ends up being people carrying cans up the whole six flights and, of stairs. <laughs> and, and I asked the question, assuming it was diesel. So it's diesel. It's not yes. natural gas piped in. Okay. Yep. Okay. Wow. Yeah, it's our only uh, diesel generator that we have. All of our other generators that we have are all propane. How big a job was the electrical to do? Because I would imagine, you know, all the stuff for the building is in place. You, you, is it just adding some wires and hooking back in? So I think they were, I'm not 
totally involved with the electrical side of it. So I think there were some um, surprises that got them uh, in regards to the transfer switch. So I think we were replacing the transfer switch um, mm. and it working, working it into the building's automation and um, a couple of other things. I, I really don't remember what it was, but something else was holding it up. Well, speaking so we of transfer switch, temporary I've, one. I, I've got a question. If you don't know the answer, that that's fine. Well, well sometimes we'll have a we'll have a, a generator expert on, but it, a transfer switch and the generator, um, th th they they tend to come together, uh, or at least they tend to get bought together. Does that imply that transfer switches really ought to be used with the same brand, same era of generator that the generator is, or or is mix and match even from different companies uh, not too big a deal? Probably a good question for a generator person, <laughs> yeah, but okay. I, don't know. Um, I, I know at one of our sites, we don't have a generator, but we have a hookup for a generator and yeah. um, it's, I don't know, Acme brand transfer. So I don't know. I don't remember what kind of what it is, but I know it's different than what our towable generator is. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's sensors in the transfer switch to. Uh, I mean, they, they got to work together, and because I've always seen them as being same brand installed at the same time. And of course, your transfer switch was as, probably as old as the generator, right? That'd be forty plus years yeah. old. Yeah, 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 forty yeah. years Something old. Like that. Yeah, yeah. Wow, wow. Okay, all right. Well, good. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the other question: music. Uh, man, yes. I mean, th this is a beautiful cinematic production you've got here, and I loved the music. I felt like I was watching, you know, some Disney movie with is somebody flying <laughs> through the sky when that generator was coming down. How do you, how do you pick your music? Uh, so I use a service called Epidemic Sound and I pay a subscription fee and that lets me use uh, anything of their catalog on YouTube without getting copyright hits or basically taking away the monetization side of things. Gotcha. So, wow. Uh, uh, is anything else you want to say about this video or its production before we uh, we move on? Uh, so that was the day we left for NAB. I was up ah. at six in the morning, and we weren't supposed to leave until late afternoon. So that was a really long day. So at the end, you can see me just kind of thinking, I need to go home and sleep for a few hours. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Wow! Yeah. Uh, now we're going to take a break, but after the break, we've got the most popular video you've ever produced. Do you want to give us a little foreshadowing? Ah, the dangers of transmitter sites. Lots and of now, dangers. Is, is this the dangers of, or is this dangerous transmitter sites? Mm. Could be either. Yes, it could be either way. Yeah. Is, there are is it just one? At, it, and there are dangers. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to transmitter sites with snakes and, uh, other critters, bad looking spiders, um, people in cars that were not supposed oh. to be there and not fully clothed. So there's dangers. We had, we had one site where we had drug deals going on all day long, right in front of it. Oh, so could you get a, could you get a, a discount yourself? You know, they, they weren't in for discounts, uh, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, I've been working under a transmitter and, uh, Heard somebody, I left the front door open at airflow or something, and I heard somebody walk in and there, and I looked under the rack. There was some rack spaces, you know, rack panels missing within the rack. There were some very shiny patent leather, shiny black shoes and a very cuffed and creased uh, pair of pants on this gentleman. And I realized this was a police officer. <laughs> and uh and I, I want to let him know i'm i'm back here everything's okay it's not a problem uh but he hadn't seen the door left open yeah yeah i'm back here i'm back here working it's okay i don't think he had his uh his uh, sidearm drawn but you, you never know That's all right <laughs> uh the dangers of transmitter sites is coming up our show is brought to you in part by our terrific friends at broadcast bionics in uh, in england but their products are all over the world lots here in the usa and all over the world. Let's hear from Broadcast Bionics. We'll be right back with Marcus O'Rourke. Welcome to the Bionic Studio. The Bionic Studio brings all audience interaction to the fingertips of a production team in radio, TV, and podcast. Our workflow-led system is working 24-7 around the world for small broadcasters and national and international networks. 
Our telephony module, Bionic Talk Show, allows cost-effective centralisation, remote operation, scalability and resilience across an entire network of stations, but at the same time is used in single studio self-op environments. Social media curation and activity is now considered a broadcast critical part of programming. Bionic Social means the studio isn't overwhelmed with a wall of interaction from an ever-growing number of social platforms. We combine SMS, MMS and email together with a speech-to-text service for listeners using smart speakers. We enable studio teams to curate, filter and display all platforms in one place and post text, images and video content to multiple platforms in one operation. Effortless collection of video content with Bionic Director has helped position some of the world's most successful stations as leaders in viral content, generating appointments to listen and free marketing via retweets and shares. Bionic Contest enables end-to-end -end tracking of on-air competitions, live reads and prizes. These can be on-air contests, automated SMS entry or online. Anywhere and Skype TX for Radio brings high quality audio and video contribution into the studio with ease. No need for dedicated PCs to run different applications, everything is controlled within the Bionic Studio UI. And incoming connections are visible to users along with all other platforms. Our codec integration enables connection, algorithm configuration and directory to a wide range of IP and ISDN codecs. The Bionic Studio, a unique suite of products designed to enable your talent to work smarter. Oh, man. Uh, viral content leaders. I, the, the viral is usually a bad word, but, you know, it can be a good thing, too, in our in our interesting world, world of words. Thanks a lot, Broadcast Bionics, for sponsoring This Week in Radio Tech. And please, you, engineer, you, you can be the leader around your place by checking out uh, Broadcast Bionics and their incredible range of software to help you make much better radio, whether it's talk shows or just uh, surfacing information and content about a particular artist or some famous person, some celebrity, uh, whatever you need to do, they got it there. They got good stuff at uh, Broadcast Bionics. All right. It is time to continue. Our guest is Marcus O'Rourke. Uh, Marcus, uh, glad that you could take some time to be here. Uh, by the way, if you hadn't heard, if you're tuning in late, Marcus is the uh, the winner, the 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 honoree. He's won the uh, SBE's Educator of the Year Award. Uh, for, for I guess for 2022, uh, and uh, he'll be receiving that award in uh, in a ceremony in Syracuse, New York, as the SBE as their uh, their national meeting there. So, Marcus, congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, you'll you'll be doing a victory lap, I'm sure, for us. Maybe we get some video of that. <laughs> get, get the drone to shoot the the victory. I don't know what you do. You run around a tower? I don't know. What do you do? <laughs> I could. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, all right. Now you've got what me we're thinking. doing on. The yeah. <laughs> what well, what we're doing on on this show because uh, I I wanted to do this anyway and hey Marcos getting the Educator of the Year award from SBE was really icing on the cake and made me think wow how serendipitous that we we uh, that I was thinking of having Marcos on the air on the show and then he won that award so I I, I got to call I got to call him so I I start texting him and and he said yeah I can I can get that on my calendar sure I'll join you so um, uh, we're watching some videos Marcos produces really beautiful and yet educational videos about the things that he does at transmitter sites. And he tells a story with each one. So uh, they are entertaining and worthwhile and, and, and fun to watch. Um, the next video is called The Dangers of Transmitter Sites. This is the longest video that we're going to watch today. And it's about 12 minutes long, but it is captivating. And it has Marcus's brand of humor uh, sprinkled through it as well. Marcus, set this video up for us, if you don't mind. So I was uh, thinking, you know, I, I see a lot of people, uh, cause part of the, the people who watch my channel are people who go off-roading to all these different mountaintop sites. And I'm thinking, you know, a lot of people who go up to these different sites, for example, our, our Santiago Peak, which is where our main station is, they have no idea some of the dangers that they could be facing up there. Uh, you know, for example, like falling ice during the winter time. It's beautiful. It's neat to go play in the snow, but if you aren't really thinking about, you know, that tower that's got six inches of ice, you know, falling off and hitting you. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. So this, that was my intent was to kind of put something together and go, 
don't, don't forget about these things if you're going to be around a broadcast station. I guess it right. also applies well, to any, any tower up there. You have a good intro in this video, too. So, Suncast, let's roll it and see the dangers of transmitter sites. Today we're talking about the dangers of a transmitter site. There are many, many dangers at these mountaintop sites, especially during the winter. And we are going to cover those here right now. Hello, thanks for joining me today. Um, my name is Marcos O'Rourke. I'm a broadcast engineer in the Southern California area, and I work for a, a group that has several different stations spread out across all the way from the border to Mexico, through Los Angeles, all the way into uh, Las Vegas. So we have a lot of different mountaintop sites, and today I kind of wanted to go through with you and talk about some of the dangers that are at sites. It's not necessarily something you typically think about, but uh, there are dangers all over a site, especially sites that are not visited as frequently. But even, even sites that have constant visitors. Um, the site at Santiago Peak, that site um, has dangers that most people don't understand. They drive up there all the time, they hike up there all the time, and they don't realize what harm they're putting themselves into. So I'm not here to scare you away from mountaintop sites. That is not the point of this video, but it's an education. It's an opportunity for you to learn um, some of the more riskier aspects of the job. You've probably seen some of the videos where we're wearing these uh, hard hats and uh, it's not necessarily in case we bump our heads, especially in the winter time, the towers will start gathering ice, collecting ice. And what'll happen is these, this ice will build up off to the side of the tower, of the antennas, of the structure itself, um, and become heavy. Uh, I've got a piece right here. You can kind of see it. This came off of one of the guy wires. And it's about a couple pounds maybe. But imagine six inches of ice, a block like this, hanging off of a tower. That could be a lot more weight. And then imagine that falling from a height of like 100 feet. So you have that danger and, and that does all sorts of damage to the site as well. So there's, there's that danger. I'm gonna change my hat back because my hat's more comfortable than this. And my voice echoes weird in there too. It's something you should be very concerned about and uh, in consideration if you are at mountaintop sites in the winter time. Now, right now, it is January, beginning of January. And I mean, there's a little bit of snow on the ground. We had about four to six inches at this site. This is the undisclosed site. And because of that, we had a lot of ice build up on the tower. But right now, I'm looking up at the tower, and there's no ice up there. So all the ice had melted, had fallen off the tower, and that's when it gets dangerous. Not when it's building up, but when it starts getting a little bit warmer. And that tower structure starts warming up, boop, that big chunk of ice falls and sometimes gets terminal velocity and makes a very large uh, crater or damage or destroying my fence or ice bridges there is damage here that I am surprised surprised by so uh, falling ice that is one danger that you may not realize is at a transmitter site so one of the more obvious dangers at a transmitter site is RF now RF is dangerous because you can't see it and it will do things to you that you don't realize until later. It's not gonna cause cancer. Let's just get that out of the way. This is not gonna cause cancer. So, but RF is going to heat your body. There are different parts of your body that are resonant at certain frequencies. Some of those are the FM band frequencies. Some of those are higher frequencies. And so you want to protect yourself 
and not have those heating things. Because if, if things inside you heat up, you're probably not gonna feel it. You're gonna start feeling, oh man, I just don't feel good. You know, and it could get worse. Um, worst case, you can, um, I don't wanna get too gross, but there are stories of um, microwave workers who were exposed right in the face and it basically um, gave them glaucoma, not good stuff. So RF, if you give it distance, is fine. Don't stand next to microwave dishes, antennas. If you look up at a tower and you'll see all these different things hanging off of it, you'll see like whip antennas, you'll see these weird FM antennas that look like weird shapes. Stay away from those. Um, big drums, stay away from those, especially stay away from the front of those, uh, like whip antennas and things like that. They're sending out RF in pretty much every direction, but a microwave dish, that's gonna be sending it down a beam. And so all of that RF is gonna get focused down this one path. So you kinda wanna stay out of that. But if you stay away from RF and being on the ground generally, you're fine. There are signs at transmitter sites. There's yellow signs, which will say warning or caution. Don't go past them uh, because generally past that, it's not safe for the general public. There's different levels. There's, there's public exposure, there's occupational exposure. So people who work with RF, people who are our engineers, uh, tower climbers, people like that, know how to work with RF, know how to protect themselves. So that's why there's an occupational limit that's higher than a public limit. So going past those signs, probably not a good idea for you. For AM stations, the tower itself is the antenna. So you definitely don't wanna be next to that. Go back and watch, I'm, just, I'm gonna link it right up here or here. Well, one of these two spots. Um, the video that we did, the, the tour of KNX 1070 in Los Angeles, there is a point where we're really close to the, the base of the tower and we're behind a fence, a uh, gate. And you'll see as I bring the camera in, there's a weird little pattern that shows up on the screen. Um, that's RF, that is a high RF uh, field. And, and it obviously did things to the recording on the camera and the sensor. So you don't wanna be too close to an AM tower. You definitely don't want to touch an AM tower. If you touch an AM tower, you become part of the electrical circuit. And there is a lot of electricity that runs into an AM station. You definitely don't want to grab that tower and be standing on the ground because now you become that path to ground for the electricity and it won't end very well for you. Let's just be, let's just put it that way. So generally there are fences for uh, security, of course, but there are fences for safety and those fences are there for a reason. So please don't go past the fences unless you work there or you have business past that fence. That's all, that's my public service uh, announcement for uh, that. Something else to keep in mind is if you visit a transmitter site during the summer or winter, or I guess anytime it's warm, you kind of want to be aware of critters, snakes, uh, cats, coyotes, um, spiders, all those different things. And this is, that's just a general, be aware of your environment out in the wilderness message. Because, you know, you're out in the wilderness and you never know. Uh, part of the reasons why we have fencing up at, at this site here at our undisclosed location is we wanted to keep, well, we wanted to keep people out, obviously. But the other one is we wanted to keep wildlife out. Uh, wildlife will tend to burrow into places where we don't want them to. They will tend to rub up against things that may cause fatigue. Um, so we're trying to keep them out of the little compound here with varying degrees of success because, well, as you saw, our fence is down and I have seen some buried up scat here. So I guess that didn't work out right. Not buried up, scat with berries in it. There we go. You guys have seen what's behind here, right? Our generators. Here at this site, we have 
a couple of propane generators and these propane generators start automatically. So another danger at a transmitter site is automatically starting equipment. You kind of want to stay away from equipment that may start automatically, like air conditioning units, uh, fans, uh, like ventilation fans, generators, things like that. You kind of want to stay away from those things that are automatically starting. One other thing that uh, you kind of want to watch out for is people at transmitter sites. Those can be dangerous as well. You have people who are there who are wanting to steal copper, break into equipment buildings to steal equipment, um, all these different things. So especially late nights, weekends, times when people would not, when the bad actors, if you will, aren't expecting people to be there, uh, you have to watch out for those as well. Um, I have come across that a few times, so. Thanks for watching today. Uh, kind of an odd video, talking about the dangers of a transmitter site. Um, but if you ever do go up to a mountaintop site, kind of want to know what's going on, right? You don't want to be unprepared. So, anyways, thanks for watching. Thanks for coming along with me. Um, here to the undisclosed location. Hey, we still have snow. I can't believe it. I mean, look. Look, I still have snow up here. What? Crazy. <sighs> Anyways, thanks for watching. Um, until next time, stay safe, stay healthy. Crazy times we're going through and uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs> wow. Wow. That was a lot of fun. And I found out some things. I have a question. <laughs> sure. uh, the, the propane generator, um, wh why do you have uh, a green cover panels making it less visible, I guess, to the public? Uh, it's not necessarily less visible. It's to kind of protect it from blowing snow. Oh, so that oh, site okay. is kind of like on this perfect ridge. Uh, so really quickly, the, the weather patterns here, the weather kind of goes around Orange County, goes through LA and right over that site there at Palomar, which is no longer undisclosed, but right over that site there at Palomar, and it can get crazy wind, ice, snow. I mean, so we put those covers up just to kind of keep it from building up on the air intakes of the generators. After your truck drove away, uh, what was the, did I see a big old tire there <laughs> on the ground? So um, the, the landowners, uh, it's a, we rent lease. Mm -hmm. Somehow there's a relationship there, uh, the site from a tribe. So they maintain that road. I mean, it is a, it is very, very well maintained. I mean, they're constantly working on it. So they have that old tire there that they'll just drag up and try to keep the road smooth. Oh, so it's, it's used as a smoothing device. Yeah. Dra dragging the tire. That's a good idea. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Well, that, uh, have you, when, when did you shoot that video? That would have been January of 21, maybe. 21. I think it so, was. Okay. yeah. Y year and a half ago. Have you, have you, is there, if, if you were to redo it today, is there anything that you would add to it that, that wasn't in there or anything that's, oh, my gosh, you know, here, here's a new uh, peril. Off the top of my head, no. Yeah. But I know okay. I saw that when, when you were asking me for the videos and I saw it and I was thinking, oh, I should have mentioned and I should have wrote it down and I didn't. <laughs> um, but it's so, so that video, I mean, sure, that video is good for engineers, but you didn't show uh, much you know, you know, inside the It was really, it was, it was for, you know, for the grounds, for the area, for, for people who may happen along. We, we hope people watch it who may be hikers or four wheelers or whatever. Um, right. Uh, let me ask you a question. And that's kind of, if, go ahead. I was just saying, and that's kind of where I'm aiming towards my, my videos is mm -hmm. it's not necessarily something for the, you know, the grizzled engineer who has been there for 50 years. You know, no, you know, way more than I will ever know. Uh, this is for people who are going, 
what does a broadcast engineer do? Uh, you know, what, you know, the DJ going, what, what do you do? So, or people in the public, just to kind of bring some awareness to it and uh, maybe bring in some more engineers in some fashion. All right, all right my, my last question before our next break is, I, I, I think your choice of answers are probably gonna be yes, no, or I'd really prefer not to say. That's, that's none of your business. And my okay. question is, for a site like that, uh, do you carry a firearm? Um, I have, mm -hmm. but in the so many years that we've been going up there, mm -hmm. um, it really would be for animals. Because yeah. we're so far away from public access at that site specifically. Oh, okay. That, okay. You know, it, it would be, there would be nobody up there. But as far as animals, you know, I think our, our biggest threat would be uh, bobcats and mountain lions. Yeah. And rattlesnakes, but I'm not that good of a shot. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Okay. Okay. Well, th thanks for that. Thanks for that answer. Uh, Marcus O'Rourke is our guest today. Marcus is, was just awarded from the Society of Broadcast Engineers, the SB Educator of the Year. I think you're starting to see why. We've got a couple more videos from Marcus. I, I hope we can squeeze them both in and we can if we hurry right up here. Hey, let me tell you about uh, somebody else that, that ought, to, ought to get an award and that is Mike Dosh at Angry Audio. Angry Audio, you know, that they make a whole line of products themselves, things like the headphone gizmo. This is the headphone amplifier that is just terrific. So well designed, sounds great. Uh, it can easily be wired uh, daisy chain style with power getting inserted on one of them and then that power continuing from one to the next using the, the Studio Hub standard. Um, and it's got uh, both sizes of connectors there, quarter inch and 3.5 millimeter you can it, it's got little rubber feet here so you, you you could lay it this way on the countertop you can screw it to the countertop you can mount it to the side but it's really meant to be mounted up underneath the countertop uh and it's got this nice curvy design so you won't snag your leg uh your pants or your pantyhose uh, on on this guy now the other thing i want to tell you about is the headphone disconnector because this i mean everybody needs these my goodness you there's a head there we are plugged in to the headphone amplifier and your talent gets up and walks away and instead of breaking off the quarter inch connector or the 3.5 millimeter connector instead of breaking that off inside here like somebody did at one of my stations uh they walk away and the headphone connector just disconnects just like that i know i was a little bit i made it a little bit hard to, to do there uh and it connects right back up because it's magnetic it's kind of like that magsafe style connector from apple but the, uh, your, your talent still wearing headphones, they get up, they walk away, and bam, it just comes right apart and saves everything else, even the, you know the, where the cable goes into the headphones. So it won't tear that up because you've got this, this headphone disconnector. Isn't that interesting that we have products that we buy now in broadcasting called a disconnector? I guess we do in electrical service too, but there you go. Check it out from Angry Audio. The website is angryaudio.com. They got all kinds of great products there. I'm telling you soon, uh, Chris Tarr is going to be the spokesperson for Angry Audio. He uses a bunch of their stuff. And, um, and also, it's where you can get Studio Hub products. You want to wire your studio with Studio Hub? Check it out from Angry Audio. Hey, This Week in Radio Tech is also brought to you by my favorite 4G modem, the Max Connect Wireless Prioritized Data Modem. Uh, here's John Tocock to tell you why they use it. With all of the recent cybersecurity attacks against large corporations, we were looking for a product that would give us the ultimate security at our transmitter sites and as well as with our broadcast equipment. MaxConnect fits the bill very well. Its greatest security feature is the fact that it gives you a single static IP address. Using this single static IP address allows us to close hundreds of open ports on our firewalls across the company and restrict access to only the MaxConnect IPs. This has greatly reduced our exposure to the World Wide Web and made us much more secure moving forward. It's also given us the ability to expand as needed in a secure fashion. What these things are built for, they're built to give you data where sometimes it's not available. Like if you're at a crowded location, a stadium, a parade, uh, maybe a car dealership where your advertising really worked and everybody showed up. Uh, this will give you prioritized data, prioritized over everybody else except first responders. And you will get to uh, uh, to anyway to uh, 
get real data through. And you get a fixed IP address, which is really helpful and really important. So check that out. Max Connect Wireless. Check out the website, maxconnect.com. I know it's spelled funny. You can look at it there, or you can click the link in our show notes and get to it that way. Uh, Josh Bone, what a great engineer. He's put together this amazing service, Max Connect Wireless. All right, uh, we are back with um, Marcus O'Rourke on uh, this episode, number 604 of This Week in Radio Tech. Marcus, our next video here uh, has to do with one of the oldest stations on the West Coast. This is uh, KNX. We're going to take a tour, and this is a place where even broadcast engineers would typically not get to go unless you had some business there or knew somebody there. And there's a lot we can learn from touring other facilities that may be like, oh, that's a good way to do that. Or, oh, I'm glad I never did that. Set this up for us, this uh, KNX tour. So it was in conjunction with uh, the, our SBE chapter in LA's, uh, every once in a while we'll do facility tours. And so we mm -hmm. did a tour of KNX and uh, brought the camera along. And it, it was a lot of fun. I mean, it was really interesting to see uh, the station and, you know, kind of grew up listening to it all the way from San Diego, and yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, let's let's go ahead and roll. Let's see this KNX tour. Today we are going to KNX 1070 here in Los Angeles. So we'll be getting a tour from the gentleman at Intercom who owns KNX these days, and um, yeah, I'm excited about this tour. We've got a great turnout. So thanks for uh, coming out on a Saturday. The documentation. Looks as if this building we're standing in was built in 1960 when this new tower went in place. This tower is approximately five eighths, just short of, longer than a half, but less than five eighths. And this building was built to accommodate it. The uh, all the transmitters were in here. Pause because I was in high school. That was the original tower. And they built the building around it. Do you own the land? No. Well, I think at this point, CBS used to own this entire park. They do. That's why it's Columbia Park. But in the round, I'll have to go look. I think I could locate a hat in here that's got the date on it when they had the transition of turning the park over to the city of Torrance. And, they, and the, the, the fenced-in areas for the transmitter and the towers and all that, that still belongs to what was CBS now in but we do not own the property, but we do maintain the ground system. And we have very strong easements whenever any party wants to build surrounding the property, like this housing project back here. That went in 1992, maybe. Uh, it was my job to supervise the ground system that was installed, so each house had a Faraday cage. So we've actually made some good progress out here in terms of beefing this up to be the news station it should be for Los Angeles. Uh, there will be some argument, but basically, KNX is the 24 hour, you know, deeply language news station for LA. And so it is, we take that responsibility very seriously. The tower went down in 1965 overnight. It was attributed to vandalism. They came out and sawed through the guy wire anchor, probably with a hacksaw, and the tower collapsed overnight. There was a sudden rush to get another tower, and the only tower that was available instantly, if I recall correctly, it was the KFAC tower that was laying on the ground at their transmitter site. They weren't gonna install it for a while, and so CBS made a deal to buy it from them, and everybody agreed, and they got it out here and had the uh, tower crew come up and put up what's now the Ox Tower as, as the temporary replacement to get it back on the air. That tower, of course, is much shorter than it needs to be for a 1070. What's KFAC? 1330. 1330, right. So it's probably a quarter wave on 1330. Half wave. This one's 500. Yeah. So 200 feet difference. There's not much more to say about that other than the fact that they did get it on the air very promptly. It only was off for a couple of days, three days, something like that. 23 hours. 23 hours. So they put up two telephone poles and a, and a flat top end. Well, I, w I, was, uh, I was in 10th grade when that happened, so I can't speak from first-hand experience. Uh, and, and it's Columbia Park, Columbia being the C and CBS. 
they gave it to the city basically. I, some money had to transfer to make it a legal sale. I think. Yeah. But the uh, important thing for us was the easements for the guy wire anchors, sure. for the CCNRs to include the ground system, and then this piece of property that we own out. This is a memento uh, from February 25th, 1984, to commemorate the park when it transferred. Is this the only station on this particular frequency in the country or just in the West Coast? Or how the West Coast. I see. I believe there are two others on the other side. Their channel doesn't necessarily mean they're across the country. Not always. Not always. Not always. Not always. Not always. Not on, on the other hand, it, it does really well in parts of five states at night. And so we, we joke around, you can't hide from it. <laughs> I, I'd like to add to that. I was on vacation last year in Oregon visiting a, a ham radio friend up in Portland. And I was driving home early in the morning, around 5-ish in the morning, down I-5. I was in Salem. And uh, one of our operators had occasion to call me for a question. So I took the call, turned on my car radio, and 1070 was sounding almost local. It was so strong. In kind of day. Day. About 5 o'clock in the morning. I see, it's right there. Our primary so, uh, STL is microwave. Not a lot of room in there, so I'll let you guys just go ahead and Thanks for watching today. This has uh, been a really, really exciting uh, tour of a very, very historical station. Uh, KNX has been around for a very long time. It's one of the older stations in the country, and it's one of the older stations in the, on the West Coast. So, uh, yeah, it was really cool to see the inside of it. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it. While you're here, check out some of the other videos that I've got and um, see some of the other uh, tours that we did. We did one with... Uh, at another station and I explain about RF safety signs. So uh, yeah, so check out some of the other videos and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, your uh, 2022 SBE Educator of the Year, Marcus O'Rourke. <laughs> Thank you. You know, <laughs> I'm listening to the end of it, and we're talking about RF safety signs. I'm going, well, didn't that just change? Like some of the, the regulations around RF safety signs just changed. So it's like, well, I guess I have to redo that one now. Oh, I, I don't know. I need, we need to find out about that. Yeah, I didn't I know. I think so. Anyways, yeah, technology, you know. We just we put signs up that that say uh, not uh, you know danger of electrocution. Not only will this kill you, it will hurt the whole time you are dying. <laughs> it seems to. <laughs> I've got I got a, a transmitter. I got a transmitter site in Samoan that says basically danger high voltage. Don't touch anything back here. It says it in English and it says it in Samoan. So you you don't get that translation very very often. And I can't very possibly. unique location pronounce it that's right hey uh so we got one more video to see and and uh let's use that as our our tip of the week uh, unless you have an extra one after that but um tell you what, let's go ahead and take our last uh break to hear from a sponsor right now marcus um you know there whenever somebody does something well does it does it great is recognized for it you inspire other people and so i'm thinking that when people know about you uh, and know about the videos you produce, whether they are broadcast engineers or maybe they want to produce videos or explainers, uh, explaining type videos or or travel logs or whatever. Maybe they want to produce, uh, uh, do videos, publish videos, shoot, edit, you know, push them out there in, in whatever topic that they're interested in, you doing broadcast engineering. Um, but to see somebody else produce that and to understand their process, that's what's coming up after the break. You want to give us just a little tease about the video we're going to see after the break? Uh, you're going to see me with a full beard. Um, so, yeah, there, there's the tease. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> okay. The process of, of uh, what goes through my mind of, of doing a video, what equipment I use, and, um, yeah. 
your your videos you know i produce videos too and and we definitely produce different styles i love your style and i feel like i'm not i feel like yours is a very cinematic style it's very very watchable and mine mine are informative but they're not as watchable as, as you i just enjoy watching you so that's coming up in just a minute we're going to uh, hear marcus's thoughts and see some techniques about how he produces his videos this week in radio tech is brought to you in part by broadcasters general store bgs.cc is the website and one of the things that bgs carries that you can get from bgs is a vox pro unit and you know a lot of radio talent says i gotta have a vox pro i gotta record my callers record my bits you can use vox pro for all kinds of stuff we're gonna hear from uh, uh st john we're gonna hear from him and be right back hang on Hey, what's happening? St. John here coming to you from Command Central and wanted to tell you about the absolute best partner you can have in radio. I'm talking about, boom, Wheatstone's Vox Pro. Lots of different audio software out there. Why Vox Pro? It's the only software designed to do what we needed to do, which is record, edit, playback in real time. When I say lightning fast, I'm going to show you how fast you can edit stuff up in Vox Pro right now. So literally three clicks on the controller, mark left, mark right, everything that gets marked, you hit delete, it goes away it's literally that fast so we're gonna take this part right here Boy, help. Nine, boom from caller nine to him saying i'm ready five. Oh. ready for that secret sound boom all of that stuff hit delete it goes away here's your edit you are tackling secret sound caller nine i'm ready Saint John. So one of the best features of version 7, this is awesome, it's effects macros and you can literally put a chain of effects together so that instead of uh, having to normalize a phone bit and then uh, use noise reduction on it and EQ it and all that, you can literally build a chain. One button, this button, this one's called call right here, I just click that, all of those processes happen instantaneously. Final thing that I love about Vox Pro, and there's so much more to get into, but uh, one of my favorite things, you can load it on a laptop. I've literally done my show from a hotel room in Armenia to uh, the conference room at, yeah, this was fun, jury duty. Great thing, no one could tell the difference. Vox Pro makes it totally easy. I'm telling you, if you're looking for the best on-air partner, call my friends at Wheatstone, ask them about Vox Pro, and you will be glad you did. You need to call uh, Broadcasters General Store at 352-622-7700. That's 352-622-7700. The number's right there on the website. BGS.cc is their uh, their web location. And I love the folks at BGS. They're all good folks. Been to dinner with these people and and I've done business with them literally for years. Probably, well, since the uh, at least the early 90s. Yeah, they've been around a while. Sharp pencils, good prices, and they can tell you usually exactly when something's going to arrive. They have a lot of lot of choices to help you out. Do you need it immediately? Can you wait a little bit? What you know? Do you need something else that's available more quickly? Broadcasters General Store in Ocala, Florida. But it doesn't matter where they are because they'll get you what you want. All right, uh, it's this week in Radio Tech with Marcus O'Rourke. He is here with us. I don't know if Chris uh, Chris Tars is uh, handy here. Uh, maybe we can get an indication from. Uh, I don't see him on the double box or no, no triple box. Maybe he's not. Marcus, um, okay, so we've teased your, I guess this is going to be a six-minute tip of the week uh, about how you produce these. Uh, I, I think the video sets itself up, but just give us a tiny little intro here. Well, I just went out to the park the other day and went, this is what I do, this is what I use, and yeah. <laughs> ah, so you, what, you shot this, what, yesterday, day before? I think this was like Monday, I think. Oh, Monday? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All righty. It was hot. All right. Suncast, let's crank up the film projector and roll it. Some of you have asked what my process is with recording and filming and all that fun stuff. So let's go through it real quick. And now there's a lawnmower behind me. Okay. I'll talk real quick like this. And as soon as I get to the lawnmower stops, the airplane's going to fly over. <laughs> okay. So I'm filming on a Canon R5C. Uh, that's what I have right here. Started off on my iPhone with some moment lenses and then I was on a Canon M50 uh, because I like the optics a little bit better. And then I moved to a Canon R, uh, EOS R, and now the R5C gives me 4K, 8K if I really wanted it, but I don't do 8K, but 4K. Um, has some great tools for uh, making sure I have good exposure, um, waveform, uh, um, vector scope, all that fun stuff. Um, and also does stills, so it lets me have a hybrid camera. So, there's there's the camera. I'm using a Rode Video NTG as my microphone. That's on camera, 
And then I also have the Rode Wireless Go. And I have it kind of with a split. So I do left channel is the shotgun mic, right channel is the lapel mic. And usually I'll have it uh, hidden inside my shirt with some, uh, I can't remember what it's called, undercover or whatever it is, sticks to the shirt so you don't really see it, so it looks a little bit neater. Um, for my drone shots, some of those drone shots that I have, I have a DJI Mini 2, and that thing's a lot of fun. It's a blast to fly. And so I'll fly that around. It takes a lot of practice uh, to get the shot that you want, and uh, just to be spatially aware what your limits are, what its limits are. And so get but some amazing photos and, and video that I've gotten from that. Um, then I also have some cameras, uh, some GoPro cameras, a GoPro Hero 7 Black and the GoPro Hero 5 Session, which is the little square one, which didn't, they didn't use very often or they didn't have for very long. Um, lighting is important. I have a bunch of reflectors. I have some uh, relatively cheap lights that I got off of Amazon um, that help me control the light because that's all that video is, is just moving pictures and lighting is key. Um, so when I go into the process, before I get to, to that day, I think about what it is I want to shoot, what it is that I'm going to be doing, what my tasks are, and how I'm going to set up those shots from my open and intro hook to my little travel montage, if I have one, to what the tasks are, the major tasks are for that day, and how I will set up my camera, my lights, uh, and my shot, and how I want it to look. Not always 100% effective or, or you know, uh, executing the vision that I have, but I get close. Um, again, I still have a lot to, a lot to learn about, about it, so. Um, so I go through that, I think about it, I shoot it. Um, usually it makes the task go a little bit longer than you know it normally would if you're not doing that. Um, and then what? And then I'll take my footage, unload it onto my, my MacBook M1, MacBook Pro M1 chip. Um, I'll also copy it to an external hard drive for safety. And then I will edit on Premiere Pro. Um, I like the Adobe Suite. I, have really gotten used to it. It's uh, Premiere Pro, uh, After Effects, and um, um, the audio one, and Adobe Audition. So those three together are my, my video editing side, and I'll take all my footage, look at it, and then construct a story, because that's really what I'm trying to do, is tell a story about what it is that I'm doing. So, um, construct the story, put that together, edit it, find some good music. I use a service called Epidemic Sound, as well as a service called Audio, A-U-D-I-I-O. And um, because both of those are licensed, I can use them on YouTube without getting copyright strikes or um, getting, you know, monetization claims. So I'm able to make a, a couple of dollars to help try to pay for some of this equipment. Then, so I will edit everything together, try to create the story arc, and then um, I'll do color correction. Um, this is what it looks like when I shoot it. It is very flat, it is very gray, low contrast, but it allows me to have more control over my highlights and over my shadows. Uh, I will put a transform LED on there, a color space transform, and then I will put in some corrections and then a final look LED on top of that to give it the coloring that I want it to. Then I will export. Usually that takes anywhere from five minutes to two hours, depending on how complex the video is, uh, how much effects I have, uh, what other layers that I have, sound effects. Um, and then from that point, I will upload it to YouTube uh, at least a day before I release it to allow YouTube to do its uh, cross, um, not cross contamination, uh, where it encodes it for different formats, different bit rates. Um, and then by the time it's ready to go for release, I have a 4K version, a 1080 version, all that that YouTube automatically creates. Um, creating a thumbnail that's visually interesting, tells a bit of the story, but kind of grabs your attention. I write a title, which is not clickbait, but is kind of clickbait -y. Something that looks interesting. Um, if there's a description that I need to put in there, put in the description, tags, um, location sometimes, uh, 
my monetization options, um, and then the end screen where it has the suggested videos. And then um, I set a schedule, okay, release at this date at this time. And then away it goes. And then when it releases, I just interact with comments after that and start planning for the next video. It's a lot, it's a, it's a big process and I'm still learning on how to do it and how to try to make it efficient and yet still tell a good story that's educational and uh, entertaining and um, yeah, that's my process. Excellent, excellent. I appreciate you sharing all that. Hey, I, I okay, I've got a, 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 a couple of technical questions. The, the undercovers, explain what that is again? I didn't quite understand that. So yeah, I have them right here. Oh, you do? So okay. basically they are um, little, there's two parts. So you get the lapel mic. So this mic here actually has a spot. You can plug a lapel in and it becomes like a belt pack. Oh. So then you peel them off. They're a little sticky. And then you put the little lapel mic on it. And then you put the little yeah. fuzzy cover over the sticky and then stick it to the inside of the shirt. So it hides it, but it keeps it there. And um, yeah, they're like okay. 10 bucks from Amazon or something like that. Okay. The, the other question, and you know, I've, I've done a light color grading on my own drone videos, but I've never used a LUT or a lookup table. Now, you, yeah. I, I have shot in that, what what what's that compressed grayscale that you know where where the so it's it all log flat? Logs. Yeah, log okay profile. shoot it mm -hmm. a log profile is d log the same thing because uh, like dji has d log yeah okay. dji has d log canon has c log sony has s log blah 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 they each have their own version and and, and the video looks kind of terrible when it comes out like this it's very low contrast but you haven't blown any whites out and and right. and nothing is typically too dark everything's kind of, it's kind of it's almost like like compression right and then yeah. uh tell me how a LUT works and why you use more than one LUT but but obviously your results are great you have great looking color <laughs> uh and and tones and flesh tones and everything else on your videos so there's there's two LUTs there's there's the technical LUT which basically takes that log footage and then expands mm -hmm. it to what's called Rec 709, which is basically like what you see on TV, on videos, what YouTube uses. And then okay. from there I adjust, okay, make sure my highlights are bright, make sure my shadows are dark, make sure that I'm not overexposed or underexposed, do all that big tweaking. And then I'll use a creative LUT to just put a little bit of pop to it. So you notice like in that part of the video, the, my face got a little bit, more redder, my shirt got bluer, the greens got a little bit greener. And it's more than just saturation, it's pulling out specific colors or it's more creative aspect of, of the look of the video. The, 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 the technical LUT kind of interests me. Be, uh, I, I guess the lookup table says, okay, we know what the camera was. We know its characteristics. If this pixel is this color, it really actually should actually be this color and this brightness and this everything else. So it's, it's, a, it's a look, it's a what, a pixel by pixel lookup table? Is that what it is? Uh, basically, yeah, it, it goes, okay, your, your shadows need to go, your shadows are going to be compressed in the log and it kind of mm -hmm. expands them out. So that way you can, it looks black, like the blacks yeah. look black, but if you wanted to raise them up, you could still see more detail in the shadows. So um, if I were to shoot into a rack, for example, and the rack is dark, I could yeah. raise those shadows up and see more detail in there uh, rather than shooting at a standard profile, which, sorry, all that data is lost. There's not much you can do. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you're shooting with any kind of camera and you get something that's what they, what they say blown out, it's, it's way too white. You've lost any detail there. You can't get that back. Right. Right. And same right. thing. If I it's too dark shadows. Yep. Yeah. If it's too dark, you, yeah. you, you cannot pull details out of data. That's not there, but if you squeeze it all, uh, now that assumes that the sensor got it to some degree, mm -hmm. it, it does, does log 
recording uh, affect the sensor or affect the, the, the recording medium? Which would be... Uh, it rec- it, it's, it's how it records it. So you could also record <clears throat> in some of the more expensive cameras um, in what's called RAW, and it basically takes the sensor saw sure. this value, that's what I'm writing to the file. Gotcha. And yep. it makes for yeah, a huge that. file, but <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's, wow. you know, yeah, it's, it's pixel for pixel. But Marcus, we, we are completely out of time and I want to thank you so much for, for joining us today. It's, it's just, it's been a blast. It's been fun. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us and sharing this knowledge and congratulations on oh, being <laughs> awarded the SB educator of, of the year. Keep reminding well, Thanks for having that. me on. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> Uh, by, by the way, uh, f- uh, a little show note uh, for everyone. Next week, our show is going to be on Wednesday at the usual time. I, I, I think I've got that right, Suncast. It'll be at the usual time. Uh, I'm going to be live at the Texas Association of Broadcasters, and we'll have some guests. I don't know who's going to be yet, but we're going to be live from Austin, Texas next week, not on Thursday, but on Wednesday. We'll be doing This Week in Radio Tech on Wednesday, and we'll play it back on Thursday at the usual time if we possibly can, if the show is finished and produced by then we'll 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 play it back uh then we have some other shows coming up that are going to be fun uh the following week this will be on thursday the 11th of august uh let's see we're going to be in uh birmingham alabama at the alabama broadcasters and then on thursday the 18th of august a lot of fun we'll be broadcasting live uh a little bit later than usual from the 75th anniversary of kwam kwam radio in memphis tennessee we'll be on a rooftop of a of a hotel overlooking the mighty mississippi river it's going to be fun for everyone so uh please join us a uh, big thanks to uh, chris tar who had to v- get out of here got a, a burned out transmission line they're trying to take care of that and thanks to marcus o'rourke for joining us today and uh, sharing his knowledge and, and uh, information with us and creativity as well big thanks to suncast for producing the show great job suncast thanks to andrew zarian the founder of the gfq network We'll see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye.